Yeah, there's no question. The, the deficit is, I mean, this cake is already baked. Just look at this past year. We're at, we're at the point now. Welcome, viewers. Today, Bill Holter joins us to dissect the economic landscape. He discusses an impending liquidity event that may prompt the Fed to adjust interest rates, examines the evolving notion of a risk-free asset, and updates us on the growing gap between silver demand and production. Get ready for a concise and enlightening conversation with Bill Holter on the crucial factors influencing our financial world. Well, first, uh, I, I do want to, and I've, I've mentioned this before, the economy itself is, it's a two-sided economy. You have the private economy and you have the, the, the federal side, the government economy. The private economy, pretty much no matter where you look, you are seeing weakness. But you're seeing like GDP numbers, uh, you're seeing overall numbers still showing growth. And that's a function of a trillion, trillion five, two trillion dollar deficits each year. I mean, if you look at look at unemployment, uh, government is has been hiring like mad and you're not seeing that in the private sector. So you are seeing a bifurcated economy where the expansion on the on the government side is masking the weakness on the private side. Yeah, there's no question the the deficit is. I mean, this cake is already baked, and I say that because we're now at thirty three, thirty four trillion dollars in debt. That's only going to go up, and it's. You're, I do believe uh, we're going to see some type of event that's going to actually force the Fed's hand into lowering rates. But if you take if you take a, a view of a year from now or two years from now, I don't think inflation or not inflation, but I don't think interest rates are going to be a lot lower than they are right now. They may be on the short end, but not out five years, 10 years, 30 years. I think there will be. Uh, I think the yield curve is going to is going to extremely uh, steepen, especially if the Fed is, you know, knocks rates down to two percent or one and a half or one percent. What's not been taken account of, well, for many many years, even before the two thousand eight two thousand nine uh, train wreck, what's not been taken into account and what's not been thought about is the risk premium on U.S. paper. Uh, U.S. paper has always been considered risk free. I think we're we're going into the zone now where there foreigners are are looking at uh, and especially foreign central banks I think are looking at uh, U.S. Treasuries and saying, "Hey, wait a minute, there actually is some risk." Um, and I guess the the very first inkling of that was back in what 2011 when either uh, Skinner and Poor's or Moody's downgraded U.S. debt, but that's been that's been a thought process since World War II is that the uh, U.S. Treasuries are the only risk-free paper assets on the planet, and they're not risk-free. And I do think that in this uh, in this zone or or you know time period, at some point in time, there's going to be a mass flow into gold because gold cannot bankrupt. It cannot. And silver also. They cannot bankrupt. They cannot default. Whereas it's, it's, the math is plain to see that the U.S. mathematically is going to default either by non-payment or having to blow the money supply up another, you know, twofold, fivefold, tenfold. They're going to destroy the currency itself. So I, I, I do think that there's going to be a uh, a rethought or investors are going to rethink what is risk free and once that comes forward you're going to see a massive flow of capital into gold and silver just look at this past year we're at we're at the point now where they're paying a trillion dollars per year in debt service and that number over time is only going to increase when it goes to a trillion five, two trillion. I mean, at this point, the U.S. only took in 
uh, and it was a record take, but it was uh, 4.7 4. trillion in, uh, in tax dollars, but 1 trillion of that goes out the door in debt service. So they're already over 20% of uh, tax revenues are going just to pay debt service. That number is only going to get bigger and bigger. And that's the math right there that I think the average, uh, you know, Wall Street guy can look at and go, hey, wait a minute, this math doesn't work. Well, first off, I think it's pretty clear going all the way back to 2008, 2009, the financial system and thus the real economy has been on life support ever since. So will the Fed really uh, cut uh, the life support to the banks in March? Uh, my thought would be, okay, so cut the life support and then we're right back to where we were a year ago when the banks were having problems. Do they cancel the, that program? That's what they're saying they're going to do is wind it down, but I don't really think they can. It'll have to be replaced by something else. What it'll be called or you know what it'll look like, I have no idea. But you 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 literally have the banking system on life support. I mean, look at the look at the run out of the banks. Look at the the deposit base that the banks have today versus where they were a year ago. I don't see any way they can actually stop that. Yeah. In in reality, I mean, they can they can say they stop it, but they're going to replace it with something else, some other type of support. One other thing, yeah. you you just mentioned the Fed. The Fed itself is insolvent. They lost $113 billion last year. And the last number that I saw two or three years ago, the Fed had only $65 billion in equity. So if they only added $65 billion in equity and lost $113 billion, you've got the central bank that issues the world's reserve currency technically insolvent, as is the ECB, as is the BOJ, as is the Bank of England. Interest rates around the world have gone up. And the bond holdings of these central banks have declined drastically. And those are huge losses against very small equity. So you're probably looking at a system right now where all the central banks in the world are technically insolvent. There's not a checkpoint with central banks. And the reason being they can print, they can print, they can print more, more money. So they never have a problem of, uh, you know, this month's paycheck didn't cover my bills. They don't have that problem because they can print. Now, banks themselves do have that problem. Uh, and obviously, uh, entities in the real economy have that problem. If their income doesn't match their outflow or match, uh, I mean, just look at a piece of real estate. So you buy a half a million dollar piece of real estate, you put a hundred, you put a hundred thousand dollars down, you borrow four hundred thousand, you wake up one day and your, your property is only worth two hundred fifty thousand. You've got, you have negative net worth. And oh, if you happen, you or your wife or whatever happen to lose your job, now you have a problem servicing it. You can't print money to service your debt. So what do you have to do? You're going to have to, you're going to have to sell and you end up, you walk away with nothing. And that's, that's the reality of where the central banks are right now. If they liquidated their portfolios, they would have a negative net worth. Now, they're not going to be forced to liquidate their portfolios because they can print the funds. You know, they can print cash. They can print liquidity. So that's the difference between a central bank and corporations and or you and I. As we bring the curtains down on this riveting exchange with Bill Holter, we invite you to ride the wave of financial evolution. If today's revelation sparked your interest, give us a thumbs up hit subscribe, and spread the wisdom. Anticipate more captivating analyses and discussions ahead. Your journey in staying informed continues. Thanks for being part of this conversation, and until next time, stay curious and stay in the loop.